Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today and sharing your valuable time. We're super excited to be hosting the third online community meetup of uh, the Thin Edge IO Open Source Initiative. And on behalf of the project team, I'd like to welcome you to our 90 minute session during which we have a lot of exciting news and topics to share with you. My name is Nadine Rahman and I'm the managing or one of the managing directors uh, in the IFM group of companies and my responsibility is the area of software sales and digital sales and marketing. With this let's have a look at what we have in store. So we have a range of presentations from the team, uh, all the updates on what has happened in the meantime, new features, new release functions, uh, which they will share with you during the next 90 minutes. So what's new in the latest version? How can it be used by yourselves and also extended? So how can you collaborate further and also give you some real implementation examples? But before we begin, a couple of housekeeping items for everyone here. So, of course, we always want these sessions to be as interactive as we possibly can. Uh, unfortunately, we can't host them physically. So in the digital world, yeah, we're very much looking forward uh, to having all of you interact with us, asking questions, um, starting discussions. Um, please feel free to use the chat. So if you're new to Teams, there's a little um, bar in your main screen. Uh, which you can hover over. You can see that controls bar highlighted um, here in the screenshot sh uh, shown in that main window, and that'll give you the controls um, where you can open up the chat side. Also, and this is even more welcome from our side, um, engage with us directly for over voice. So raise your please raise your hand if you have a question and we'll be ha very happy to engage in a conversation with you. We have always allotted uh, times um, after each session to have a proper discussion with you and also some more time in the end, hopefully if we don't run over. We have a couple of polls prepared for you as well. Um, so um, please also feel free to engage um, uh, in those question and answer sessions that we have uh, prepared for you as well. A uh, quick update on who we are. So obviously we're here uh, representing with the presenters. We're part of the Thin Edge IO project team, contributing partners. But of course, we're very much looking forward to engaging with you as well, our open source community, because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. We want to create a new open source community and grow and expand. Um, uh, and this will only work, of course, if we're all collaborating together. So without further ado, let's have a look at our agenda for the day. Um, we have a couple of sessions lined up for you. Updates, new release features by Andre Schreiner and Matthias Betz. Um, then we're going to look at uh, how we, as one of the technical partners, IFM, are actually leveraging what we do in as part of uh, the Thin Edge IO uh, consortium for our own business at IFM and how we implement that, and then um, how we are contributing what we do with uh, IFM also back into Thin Edge initiatives. And then at the end, hopefully we'll get some more time to share stories, ask questions and connect in general. So with that, Matthias, Andre, I would hand over to you guys. Thank you very much, everyone. Yes, so thank you, Nadine, uh, for the warm welcome. All right, then let's start with our first talk today. So my name, my name is Matthias Betz. I'm working uh, for the IFM Solutions, which is a division at IFM that is uh, responsible for digitalization and software business. Um, 
And uh, yeah, I also want to introduce Andre Scheiner. He's actually Product Manager at Software AG. And yeah, he wants to give us a short overview about the new things in the current release 0.6. Yeah, let's start right away. So Andre, over to you. All right, let's get started. Let me share the screen. Great, yeah, thanks Nadine, thanks Matthias, also welcome from my side. Um, so yeah, today as, as Matthias outlined, we want to give you, um, a, a, first of all, an introduction. If you're new to Thinnet.io, we want to provide you a quick overview of what it is, what the project is about, and then talk about the latest release highlights and also where you can find, uh, you know, community content, things like demos, tutorials, and um, how you can join us. So. Let's get started with a quick overview. So for the ones uh, who might be very new to the project and the community, I want to emphasize yeah, the main objectives of ThinHIO. What is ThinHIO about? So uh, if we would summarize it, so with ThinHIO, we want to make device enablement for IoT easy and at the same time without creating any set, uh, ecosystem or platform locking. So what that means is that uh, to achieve this, we are building a modular and lightweight IoT device framework. That's why we called it Thin, as a foundation for your IoT project. So Thin Edge, in the end, is a is a glue, right, between your devices and any IoT platform that you want to use. It can be deployed on resource constrained devices such as PLCs or protocol gateways, and allows you out of the box connectivity to IoT platforms, but most importantly, also the device management functionalities and features that you know, we all need if it comes to IoT and rollouts of devices in general. So things like software management, firmware management, monitoring of devices, and so on. And to achieve our mission, we joined forces with partner companies from the industry and industrial automation area. Um, you see, we, we are here representing uh, Software G IFM, but we also have contributors uh, from the industry like uh, Adamos, Kunbus, um, and um, Nexus Group, for example. And um, just to um, also give you a little bit um, of um, what, what are the advantages or guiding principles for, for the project, um, our focus is really on the aspect of freedom of choice. So when it comes to programming languages, uh, things like message payloads, um, but also the platform that you choose. So what we provide is a uh, not only uh, this type of pre freedom to choose any IoT platform or any component that you want to extend Synedge with, but also uh, out of the box functionalities in the area of device management, as I mentioned, with a plugin mechanism uh, to support, for example, different types of software uh, artifact types, so you can uh, remotely manage the software and, and firmware running on your devices. And the Key focus for us um, is also to be modular and efficient in terms of resource consumption on the device. That means that when it comes to things like CPU and memory footprint, we are trying to be as, as lean and as thin as possible to also support devices that you, for example, could not run containers on. So now let's take a very quick look on where we stand today. So this is um, an overview of the um, uh, architecture of ThinHIO, and let's also focus on the uh, 0.6 highlights. So first of all, let's start with communication or um, um, interfaces. So what we offer with ThinHIO today is we combine it with a generic MQTT interface. That means that you can use MQTT for the uh, connection to your IoT platform, but also you can use MQTT for inter-process communication. And um, we also created a simplified uh, so-called ThinEdge JSON format, so you don't have to worry about different um, payload formats to use. A and with mappers, you can also um, use your preferred formats and translate into different formats. Now, um, when it comes to IoT platform support, uh, what we support today is um, um, all Cumulosity IoT-based um, platforms. So we also, you see a list of also partners that, that also leverage Cumulosity here and there. So uh, things like telco platforms, for example, from, from A1, or we also can interact with Siemens MindSphere. Uh, but we also support, uh, and this is uh, an important aspect of the project, uh, 
other IoT platforms. So Azure IoT, you have uh, support for that, and you have a, a first preview that is coming really soon, uh, will be published also as, a, as an example for AWS IoT. And uh, one important aspect is also security. So one example is that you can use your uh, X509 certificates to interact with those platforms. I mentioned device management already, a very important focus area. So um, here we are really started, we, we have started with a flexible monitoring approach, but also, as I mentioned, offer a plugin mechanism to support and manage different types of software artifact types that might uh, run on devices. So you have uh, typical things like managing Debian packages, if we are really talking mostly about embedded Linux system here, but uh, we also have examples for uh, Docker, or other types of packages that might run on uh, such devices that you can then manage. Uh, for the usability, we focused on a command line interface that allows you to easily install and connect Synage uh, to your IoT platform and for the configuration aspects as well. And now one of the most important uh, areas for us is really the aspect of extensibility. So we have uh, not only strong partners in the project that really contribute own uh, products and services that can interact or integrate with Synage, but we also have uh, community members who are really extending and creating new uh, implementations based on Synage.io as a foundation. So you can find that on GitHub in the examples repository. And just to highlight a couple of interesting projects here, we have things like running all the Synage components in Docker. For example, if you want to try it out quickly and experiment with it without using an actual device, uh, just run it in a container. Or we even have examples where um, community members have created uh, local user interfaces to configure Synage. Um, so if you just want to have a you know, self-service approach doing that, uh, there, is a, there are examples as well that you can use and also extend yourself. Um, and yeah, just focusing on the latest release. So um, what we do in the ThinEdge project is really based on the early adopters that we have, but especially the community and the feedback that we get. So one important feedback for us was um, the support of different types of um, uh, telemetry data, but also uh, what we have done lately is we extended the data model to also support um, events, so-called events or alarms for devices that are connected to Synergy itself, so in a, in a gateway uh, scenario. So events um, can be used, for example, to trigger signals when uh, yeah, some events happen, for example, a person entering a room or someone logging into a machine. So that can trigger an event and it's really simple uh, to send this event from ThinEdge to your IT platform. And an alarm would be quite similar, but here we are really focusing on events that require human interaction or a response from an automation system. So for example, a certain threshold is exceeded or uh, an ex unexpected event um, like a sensor failure uh, where someone needs to react. What we also have done is uh, we, uh, or another feedback that we got a lot is the support for different uh, Linux systems or different devices that Synage needs to run on. So we try to be as flexible as possible and to deploy to as many devices and architectures as possible. And for that, we uh, also did some improvements when it comes to init systems. That means that now we support, um, uh, yeah, the, um, other init systems, uh, we use systemd as a, as a default, but this can be easily now extended so you can run Synage itself on other devices, on other uh, operating systems, on other embedded Linux systems, uh, and you can configure all of that uh, in a simple configuration file. And last but not least, we also added uh, more support to use Synage.io as a foundation for also device partners and now in the first place to be certified with uh, Cumulosity IoT. That means that you can use ThinEdge.io as a device partner to, to really integrate your device very quickly and easily uh, into Cumulosity and get certified, which means you fulfill all the uh, functionalities that you need uh, to be a, a, a featured partner. Right, and all of the stuff that I explained, um, you, if you want to have the details and if you want to see how all of this works, 
there is a demo uh, on YouTube that you can find on our YouTube channel, uh, or you go into our Medium blog, uh, and there you see all the for all the releases we have, um, you know, uh, created a blog entry and detailed out all the new functionalities and features that you can use. Right now, handing over to Matthias. Yeah, thank you, Andre, for the for the nice uh, overview. Um, yeah, what, what I want to um, um, highlight here today, um, uh, as, as uh, uh, yeah, to close uh, this this first session, is the um, the, uh, the way we work together and we we the way we document our work together and how we collaborate. So, of course, uh, it's an open source project. Um, so, um, most of the content that uh, is created is, um, is, is, is on GitHub in the um, in the um, Thinage um, project, um, so you can start right away from there and go all through the through the different uh, sub projects of, of Thinage um, to see what we are doing and then see all the content that we create. Um, there's also the um, the documentation on the Thinage uh, .github .io page, uh, so we can all see see yeah, well structured documentation what we currently have and how we can use it. So and, um, on the next slide, I just want to uh, just give you a brief introduction on um, um, yeah, how, how we come from, from idea to product, so to speak. Um, so when, when, it, when, when you have something in mind um, and, 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 and you have a question or also a concrete idea, you can uh, go to the discussions uh, section of the, of the project on GitHub um, and, and start from there. Um, this is one, one important possibility to just um, yeah, get a touch results, uh, articulate something that, that, that's on your mind, um, um, also for, for to change things or to add uh, interesting things. Uh, and we start from there and, and then the core team um, of the maintainers can, can take it from there and, 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 uh, yeah, and, and, and put it on the roadmap, for instance, or uh, get back to you uh, for further discussions. Um, yeah, the, regarding the roadmap on the right side, we have um, an, 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 an own area in the, on the Thin Edge side on GitHub, uh, where we have a kind of a uh, yeah, backlog uh, oriented release by release uh, planning table with all the things we want to achieve in the different releases. Uh, you can get there a pretty good overview of which things are already decided and, and how, how we will proceed from there. So that's uh, also important to mention uh, to, to, to if you have uh, uh, interest in the, in the details regarding the content, just go there and um, yeah, have a look on the roadmap as well. Um, um, if you want to get in touch with the team and you have really just a short conversation, uh, just to chat a bit, or if, if you want to uh, just get more in touch with us in a more informal way, um, you can also um, visit our Discord uh, uh, channel where we uh, have uh, several sub channels for beginners, for for, uh, for announcements, for, for 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 everything you can imagine. And it's always uh, a good place to be there to 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 get to get an idea how how we work together, how the whole collaboration goes on, um, and, and you can also add questions there. You can 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 put ideas there, and we we also take care that the things uh, end up at GitHub uh, in the end if it's if it's interesting and relevant for the for the whole uh, project. So, um, and uh, yeah, usually we, we really get back to you really fast. Uh, so we have a high awareness on that channel as well. Um, so it's just, uh, yeah, click on the links, um, uh, type, type in the links in your browser, go there, try it out, um, uh, and just get an impression of what we've done so far and how we work. Um, it's really interesting and exciting to be there. Okay. Perfect. So, Andrew, again, thanks for the summary. And um, yeah, I'll come back now to the to the main agenda. So, okay, let's come to our next contribution for today. Um, so, my colleagues from IFM Software, Marcel Müller and Matthias Meyer, Bayer, sorry, I always did that wrong, would like to present you today an interesting and promising proposal of an architecture innovation of, for the NetJIO. 
Um, they already implemented their new approach in a prototypical way uh, to evaluate it and validate it. And today they want to present the core idea and the experiences they made along, the, along a concrete example of connecting um, a commercial IFM product, software product, it's IFM Moneo, it's an IoT software suite to acquire data, pre-process it and uh, pass it over to other target systems. Um, and they want to um, uh, connect this with, uh, with Microsoft Azure IoT Hub using the Azure Hub. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really curious. And Marcel, over to you. Just switch over to the right slide deck. And here we go. Thank you. All right. Hi, I'm Marcel. And I'm Matthias. <laughs> All right. And I will I will start with the presentation with. Um, a quick overview of um, one of the goals I would say that went into it and also um, how we kind of got there. So at the beginning, um, we saw a nice overview of what we wanted to achieve, right? And for us at AFM, it's important that we might find a way where we have our sensors on one side with the data and everything and to get it someplace in the, in this case, uh, we chose the cloud, for example, and have a easy way to do it. And FinEdge um, solves this, of course, and we had some uh, when we then joined the project. We had some. Uh, we looked. We looked at how everything works and how the whole project was uh, organized, and um, we worked together uh, with the team to also answer some of our questions. Since um, well, everyone I would say in this field has different uh, demands, different kind of um, I would say requirements on the project, and we wanted to see how we can kind of like make sure that everyone is satisfied with the end product and is able to actually uh, use it. Um, and for this, we thought about how um, things could, for example, look like for Finesh. So we proposed uh, an architecture which you might recognize already. It's, it's quite similar. You have different paths that uh, talk to each other. And so the, the image might be a bit crowded, but it's, it's, it's fairly simple. And uh, I would say what you already seen before, where you have um, some data source, in this case, I have a Moneo talking uh, to an MQTT broker. And we kind of want to get that data from that MQTT broker to Azure. And how do we do this? And well, we do it, the I would say, similarly to the previous way, but this time we uh, have chosen what happens, actually, if instead of, I would say, having a loosely kind of uh, type message where it's just a bag of bytes with an MGT message, we kind of like enforce some kind of order into the whole graph of different parts that speak together. And what can you do with that? Like, um, and what happens when you do it? And so what you can see here is that similar to before, you have some component of Finnage that speaks MQTT, receives the incoming MQTT message. You have a mapper that transforms that MQTT message into a measurement, and that then gets sent to where you want it to. So in this case, the Azure Bridge. And the Azure Bridge itself knows how to handle measurements, so it will easily accept it. But since it can handle measurements, they can come from anywhere. So for example, CPU statistics, if you want to know how the device is doing, um, you will be able to receive that through the same kind of channel where you just simply plug it in and say, please CPU plug in, send it also to the Azure Bridge. And the same way, of course, you still have this outside connectivity to extend it as, as, as far as you wish, where, for example, through uh, your Python scripts, you will be able to do the exact same thing where you can send, uh, for example, in this case, events to Azure, which is something that it also accepts. And uh, we kind of built this whole model where instead of having, I would say, this microservice oriented architecture, you just have a single executable, which for our use case makes it easier, for example, um, to deploy it and also have some more assurances about its runtime and how to update it, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, well, the end result is it, it does work. We get messages to the cloud and are able to uh, yeah, route it through this, I would say, garden of plugins inside of Finage. Um, so to explain to you how this kind of works and how we believe the whole thing um, can be done, we split it up into two parts. The first part is going to be from an end user perspective where no code is going to be involved, just simple configuration. And there's going to be a second part from a developer perspective where there will be some code involved, 
Uh, but I think that's natural as a bit of development. Um, so starting from the user perspective. So obviously there are some steps that are needed that are outside of Finance, so to speak. So you need a Monero installation, you need to configure Monero, you have some MTT broker outside, and you need to have an Azure IoT hub that is able to receive messages. And then we can focus on the part, I would say, that is like this project, which is how to would how would you configure this FinEdge um, instance that you have. So let's dive right into it. So you would have a single configuration file in which you kind of define the graph of plugins that kind of exist, right? So you always you always have this graph. It's usually implicit, but we chose to make it explicit. You exactly say from where to where does information flow so that you have complete control over it, are able to log it implicitly, are able to transform it as you wish. And to do this, we kind of thought, OK, well, what does there exist? How does it work? How could you do this, right? So you, so we chose that there's a concept called plugin kind, right? So it's, for example, an MQTT, right? So you can have a plugin kind of MQTT that listens somewhere for MQTT messages and sends them further along for processing. And this needs to be configured. So the configuration file is born, and in there you can see quite naturally that well, we have an MQTT host that uh, listens on uh, that exposes the port on localhost 1883 and we want to send all the messages that we receive on it to our target plugin which in this case we call Moneo and Moneo well it's configured in the same way in that you say okay well it's a kind Moneo mapper so you could have multiple if you wanted to if you had multiple data sources for example um, so not just Moneo but another kind of mapper um, and this mapper needs to know, well, where does do you send that data? And in this case, we send it to a plugin called AG, AZ, short for Azure, uh, which we define subsequently as the type Azure Bridge. And it is configured with all the data that you need to, um, to authenticate to the bridge. Um, and you then, when you then actually start up FinEdge, you get all the nice lookout, but you can see what actually happens inside. So at the top, you can see what kind of plugins exist. So we already wrote quite a few. There's, uh, for example, an average plugin, a sysinformation plugin, which we talked about earlier with the CPU stuff. Um, and then you can see that only the plugins that we configured start up, right? The others do not start and are not touched at all since we day weren't asked for. And after that, you can see some log output of actually receiving a message over MQTT, it being sent around inside this FinEdge IO configured instance before the last plugin in the in that chain, which is the Azure Bridge, sends a, a, just an info output of, well, we actually sent it. And then it's on Azure side to handle it. So what are the key takeaways of this, I would say, proposal that we have is that misconfiguration of any part causes FinEdge to emit an error and exit directly, giving the user direct feedback, which is in our eyes very important because you do not wish to have data, for example, lost because you mistyped some MQTT topic. And the same way, we also want to make sure that if it worked once, it will continue working in the future, which is that we find that configuration needs to be reproducible. There shouldn't be any runtime tinkering during um, that are, that is major in any way that uh, would change, I would say, the properties of the different parts. Um, and then there comes some, I would say, very nice properties is that the messages are typed, which means that you can ensure that plugins have a common interface they can rely on, and well, the data flow is dictated by the user. So for example, how this could look like, there's an unknown plugin kind, MTT, well, it's because you mistyped it, that's called MQTT, right? And then it just doesn't stop. Or for example, you try to send measurements, to a plugin that is unable to handle them, which in this case is a filter plugin. And um, you also get an error because, well, what should it even do with that? That's obviously a user error. So it tells you that. And how does we how does a plugin of achieve all these things? Well, that's what Matthias is gonna tell us now. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. So I'm gonna take you through how a developer would uh, implement uh, this data mapping from your data source to Azure. First of all, in this scenario, we are implementing the plugin in Rust. Other uh, programming languages will, of course, be possible, but due to the nature of this, uh, it's just an example. We are talking about Rust in this case. So, um, first of all, of course, you need to set up a new Rust 
project and you're not, uh, a new Rust crate where you implement your code. This is where your use cases are implemented. Then you need to implement a required and a required API, which uh, consists of two parts. Um, first of all, you need to have a plugin builder that is able to instantiate your plugin. And the second part is you need to implement, of course, your plugin and you need to declare it, which is where your um, custom, uh, where your domain specific um, knowledge goes. Then you need to register your plugin builder within ThinEdge.io, which is um, you need to make it available to ThinEdge. So ThinEdge is able to start it and um, process its, uh, its life cycle. So in this case, we are going to send random measurements. It's just an example. We send random measurements uh, to some plugin in the, within the ecosystem at a configurable uh, interval. So for example, every second we send just the float value to some other plugin in, within the ecosystem. Um, as you can see on the right side, we need to have an address, which, um, which is um, your external interface, something you talk to and send measurements in this case to, and you need to, be, uh, you need to declare what your plugin can receive. In this case, we cannot receive anything. It's just an example I said. Next, um, you need to uh, implement the plugin interface, and the plugin interface consists of two parts. The first part is you need to st somehow start your plugin, um, which is the main entry point of your plugin. So this is basically like a main function. In this case, we are just um, starting a main loop, which ticks every um, configurable uh, amount of milliseconds, and um, just start this main loop, and then um, the plugin is basically started. Um, in the lower section, you can see the main function, which um, generates a random value and packs it into a measurement object and then sends this uh, measurement object to another plugin. So, of course, you want to give your users the possibility to configure this, um, this, this plugin that you just wrote. So, um, in this case, we are defining a um, configuration object where the user is able to set uh, the interval that uh, the random numbers should be created and uh, a target. This target is the other plugin you, your, your user wants to talk to with, with this random uh, measurements. And then we need to make a, a function available to ThinEdge that is able to instantiate your plugin. Right, right you first inst instantiate your plugin, then you start your plugin and uh, ThinEdge takes care of the whole life cycle. So in this case, we are uh, seeing the instantiate function in the lower section. And what this does is it uh, fetches the configuration for your specific plugin, then fetches the address of uh, the plugin you want to talk to, and then uh, emits the, the plugin instance. So um, what are the key takeaways here? Um, the plugins in this case was implemented. The plugin in this case was implemented in Rust, but other um, programming languages would of course be possible, but would have to implement basically the same concepts as we just saw. Um, everyone is uh, has to declare their plugins through an API, so ThinEdge can uh, ensure that the compatibility between plugins. Um, um, to be able to like compose the application out of them. Um, end users are assured that the plugins are compatible with each other in the ecosystem. Um, and um, because you stay, um, you implement a common API, end users are now able to compose um, which plugin talks to which. Okay, thank you. Um, this was how to write your own plugin. And uh, we are now open to questions. Okay, so thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Marcel, for um, yeah the interesting insights um, of this um, uh, yeah kind of innovative approach that to some extent differs from the way we work and we in, in incorporate the, the different plugins today. But um, yeah, this is uh, really something we want to get feedback on. Uh, we already discussing that in the community. Um, 
uh, quite intensively, and and uh, we really want to yeah um, open up our rationals here um, and, and discuss it with you. So, um, if ah, are there any questions from from the audience uh, from your side? Let's see if something happens in the chat. Ah, there's 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 the hands coming. There's the hand coming up. So Mario Heidenreich has a question. So I unmute your mic now. Yeah. Okay. okay. Ah, Can you hear me? Go. go okay. ahead. Uh, thanks for the presentation first. Uh, I, I really like the approach that you take with the plugins in general. Uh, makes it much more modular. Um, so one thing I quite didn't understand is that you were talking about communication between the plugins. Is this going to be still over the MQTT broker or is this like in? Um, so I me back again. Um, so in this case, we chose that the direct the communication between the plugins, if you choose to, is between um, is in process, which has the advantage that well, you don't need to serialize and deserialize every time. It's just a, I would say just a pointer, so to speak, that gets sent around. Um, but at the end, it's just code, so you can choose to also use different methods if that's what you wish. Okay, so is it like then a point-to-point -point communication, or can you kind of have multiple plugins listen to this output of a single plugin, etc.? So do you keep the flexibility that like you have with the typical pub sub mechanism that you have on a broker? Um, so you can definitely send messages to multiple plugins at the same time, um, which would in this case be in your configuration just an array. Of uh, of target plugins that you wish to send things to, so I think that the answer would be yes to your question. Okay, great. And uh, you said you have to configure this pipeline, and then you kind of make sure that plugins are started in a correct order. So you kind of have a dependency management there. Mm, so uh, so there is no direct dependency management at starter. The thing that is, um, I would say, checked is that the plugins, plugins. so that the plugins, the plugins talk to each other, um, have, I would say, the ability to support the messages that are going to be sent later on. You see what, where, where that goes. So it's not dependency itself, but uh, yeah, the ability to, like kind of like a type check, so to speak, in other languages, but for finish. All right. Okay. Okay, and that will be tested during startup. So, exactly. like, okay. Because I, I mean, what we probably don't want is to have like this kind of dependency hull where you need a plugin to work for other plugins, and if you have different versions or cyclic uh, dependencies, then everything breaks down. Exactly. No, um, that is in my so it's like this is just a prototype, of course. So I can't speak for the future. But I don't think that any kind of dependency is required since the whole idea is that for the whole thing to be asynchronous. So um, if there is any kind of dependency between, uh, I would say, plugins, that can be resolved in another way than uh, at startup. Okay, thanks. All right. Cool. So, not sure. So, um, yeah, coming to the next talk. Um, and final talk of this today's session so will be held by uh, Matthias Bayer and me. So I'm uh, actually introducing myself, which is kind of weird, but um, however, I guess we can deal with that. Um, and yeah, we want to talk about why if IFM in particular has decided to invest in Thinage.io and how the project could help us uh, to build smart devices with edge capabilities. And um, yeah, and yeah, we will basically provide a brief history of, of IFM as a company and based on that history um, and through the positioning of our gateways and edge devices, um, um, we want to position these, these edge gateways and devices in an established categorization we uh, found uh, at the Linux Foundation. There's a working group there uh, called uh, Linux Foundation Edge, so the LF Edge, and we would like to deduct our core requirements um, for adopting furniture for our products. And, um, just want to um, yeah, 
present this to you and share our thoughts on that. So, and, uh, uh, yeah, during that session, I will also uh, ask Matthias later on a couple of questions in his role as an, an expert for the NetJO um, to, um, yeah, just a couple of questions uh, about the underlying technologies and, and the underlying underlying architectural assumptions. And, and yeah, because I really want to know how they fit to our, to our needs when, when I yeah, have a look on, on, the, on the IFM products uh, we currently have and also we will have in the future. So, so give, give me just a second, switch over to the right slide deck and uh, yeah, we'll start um, uh, with that session right from there. So yeah, as already mentioned, uh, Matthias Bayer and me, we're working with IFM. Uh, Matthias Bayer in the um, software development department and um, uh, uh, yeah, me, me working as a product manager, um, uh, taking care for the market needs and creating new ideas and detecting chances in the, in the IoT market uh, with respect to uh, yeah, various uh, um, uh, connectivity topics. So yeah, so IFM, what, what is IFM? I really want to make it brief and I do not want to uh, bore you with, with uh, any uh, company presentations. So, but I just want to give you an, 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 an impression uh, where we come from and, and, and why particular aspects of, of this project are really relevant for us. So this is part of this, this idea of the whole motivation why we uh, started to invest in that. So IFM has been founded um, in the late uh, 1960s has been based uh, 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 on yeah, basically a new principle and presence detection, which was during that day uh, really kind of a brilliant idea. And since then, I've built up a portfolio of sensors for different use cases, domains, and industries. And, um, and, and this is basically still uh, well, general, still our main foundation and business model. So we've been producing. Uh, yeah, really uh, lots of different kinds of sensors for different uh, industries and use cases uh, and domains. And um, yeah, and coming from that, after some decades of, of doing that business and growing, um, and, and also being a global player in terms of standardizations and, and, and also playing a key role of the introduction of the IO link standard, um, yeah, we entered to some extent also the, 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 the market of industrial communication because it's quite the, the, the usual thing you do. You, you're coming from the, from, the, from, the, from the physical world, um, from sensing and so on, and then, then go over to providing that information um, for the network and control um, um, on the customer side, um, connecting the, the sensors to, to field buses. And um, and also yeah, provide that information, and, and, and that was really an important step to complement our portfolio in the direction. And this comprises PLCs for mobile machinery as well, and PLCs and connectivity modules uh, to interface with industrial standards and field buses. So on. and then roughly ten years later ago, we started to invest in the industrial Internet of Things and Industry 4.0. By doing so, we, we 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 entered this complete new market for us by by position IFM as a first step as a kind of data and information product. And so, so this is more or less here the the, the third column um, of this step by step development of our company. And um, yeah, and to do so, uh, of course, we started to extend our existing products that originally has been designed and optimized for automation and control use cases with additional features to also provide the measurements and events to support IoT use cases. Um, so we extended um, uh, the, the, the products to, to not only provide information to, to the automation and PLC layer, but also to the information systems at the customer side. And, uh, and currently we're still already working on the complete end-to-end -end solutions uh, based on, on, on software products. We really have kind of sensors connected to, to, to uh, software systems um, at the customer side, but also um, uh, in, in cloud platforms. So this is basically the, the way we're approaching this whole um, the market of IoT. And um, yeah, based on that, that continuum um, um, of this edge continuum uh, provided by the Linux Foundation, um, uh, I just want to um, yeah, show you the taxonomy um, of edge computing layers. Um, um, 
because it's, it's, it's kind of interesting to, to, to position ourselves and our products in that continuum to give you an impression uh, what is what is what what is what are our main needs and what is driving us. So due to the history of Adam, we cover uh, the edges. Yeah, right. Starting from the most left side of the spectrum, um, which is called uh, the user edge realm here in this um, in this um, overview and this taxonomy. And in the class of the constraint device edges, IFM provides different gateways and preprocessing units, and those units usually implement. Uh, the transition between connected sensors and the industrial networks and control areas. So they are specialized to some extent for a particular task um, to do exactly like this. So we have, for instance, these Ionic masters, which are field devices and offer interfaces for field buses and also for IoT centric access. Another other example is um, that you can see here it's this is a vibration analysis unit. And um, this, this unit just has this one task to derive couple of mechanical KPIs uh, that represent the condition of a machine uh, based on more than 40,000 samples per second of accel acceleration sensors, for instance. So um, these devices are mainly driven by microcontrollers without any sophisticated Linux operation systems or, or similar, and are often programmed in C, and they, and they really optimize to exactly fulfill this task as cheap as possible when it comes to hardware, of course. So, then coming over to the next uh, taxonomy, so in the class, class uh, Smart Device Edge, IFM develops more and more generic hardware platforms that support different use cases. So these hardware platforms usually are driven by ARM-based CPUs, have roughly 512 megabytes or one gigabyte of RAM, and provide a full-fledged Linux distribution um, that is, has been built for, for the ARM hardware architecture. And those devices usually run commercial software packages or provide runtime environments for applications developed then by our customers. So therefore, even if the resources may sound sufficient, uh, the computing power needed by the domain-specific software applications often exceed 60 to 80%. So, so uh, to enable those devices for edge connectivity and device management functionalities, this often not much of resources left. So, so, so this, this, this resource constraints are also valid for this um, class of devices as well. So yeah, one may ask now why IFM does not provide more computing power resources. It's so cheap today to meet uh, the needs uh, of those cloud native development practices that I mentioned here uh, below uh, in, in, in that, in, in that uh, area down there. Uh, as in criteria. Um, yeah, the reason lies in the positioning of the devices in, in just two markets. So one market is the OT domain. This market is really price sensitive. So that means that the product are designed or the product design is driven by a well-defined use case usually, and the hardware is optimized to support exactly that use case. So the resulting product must compete then with other devices from other vendors. And the resulting price is really critical, a really critical part of this competition. So and then you have, on the other hand, the other market for the same device, uh, which is the IoT domain. And, and here we cannot really anticipate the concrete use case yet in advance. And, 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 yeah, and, and to some extent, missing resources always limit the possibilities, right? So um, more power would enable the devices to support more and more use cases, of course. But this would put risk on the success of the same device in the first place in the OT market. So by making it too expensive, though, it's kind of a pity situation. And, um, and this dual use character of those devices for OT and IoT use cases pushes the development always and consequently towards performance optimization. So this is really important to mention here. And um, yeah, and coming to the, the last category, so the third class of this on-prem data center edges, how, how the Linux Foundation calls it, represents usually IPC-based appliances that provide plenty of resources, of course. But these hosts at IFM, at least at IFM, are, are usually dedicated to run, um, for instance, in our case, the IFM on AO IoT software suite uh, for the on-premise use cases. And the, the main challenge of those edge computers is then 
they are managing the life cycle of the of the of the whole appliance, so of the underlying operation system, and also the applied Moneo modules. So the typical commercial IoT applications uh, therefore need a secure, reliable way, um, um, but but also resource efficient way uh, for device management um, and, and for a device management agent that only needs as few resources as possible. Uh, just to, to leave as much power as possible to the IoT application itself. So, and um, yeah, for that particular use case, uh, the main device management use cases are software manage of, management, of course. So we really have to react on things that have to be patched on the Linux OS level, uh, which is really important uh, nowadays when it comes to cybersecurity. But it's also relevant to update the Moneo software modules uh, when it comes to bugs or uh, when it comes to regular releases. So, um, and, and also, which is also something that we have to take account is the firmware updates for the connected devices that are connected to the to the um, yeah, Moneo uh, edge computer. And uh, yeah, device monitoring is also uh, really important uh, to, to get a clear understanding um, um, how is the hardware, how is the host uh, going? So um, with regards to CPU usage, memory usage, um, and, and how we um, um, yeah, uh, uh, utilize the, the, the hard drives or the SSDs. So this is uh, also something that's highly relevant because we also use those platforms to store data before we forward it to target platforms. So when it comes now to the embedded development process at IFM, usually it's, it really just Starts with an with an um, with an um, yeah uh, idea coming usually from product management or from sales um, um, where we just detect a particular chance to position a new product in the in, in our markets and um, and going from there we uh, we try to assess um, the um, the requirement uh, what what is actually really needed by I don't know 80 90 percent of our customers potentially. Um, what is what is maybe too special um, to, to uh, maybe there's a chance to keep it out, and this leads to a product definition, and then usually there's a kind of a development project starting with all the different method methodologies and, and, and spirits and approaches, um, and in the end the result of such a, a project is something that really has to be tested, and, and, and the quality assurance is really extensive because um, we, we always have to keep in mind if we, if we introduce a product in the market, um, we, we, we have to, to, to assume that it will be used at least five up to 10 years, sometimes even much more longer. And, um, and this is something that, 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 that's really highly relevant for us because um, um, yeah, this, is, this is something that, 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 that's really important also for our brand, but also for our customers have something that, that's really stable and lasts for a long time. And then after that, um, we, we have a kind of an approval for a serial production. And then uh, when it comes to the combination of software and hardware, there's at least one um, a process that uh, at IFM that, 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 um, um, that defines that the deployment of the software has to be done during production. and. Uh, um, and yeah, this is this is something that, that has to be really easy and has to fit in our production processes. Which also leads to some uh, requirements uh, on that. So yeah, based on all these discussed considerations and the background of the presented taxonomy, uh, yeah, we, we we really derived just a couple of yeah, sometimes even non-functional requirements that comprise uh, several aspects like. The life cycle of the OT devices, which can be pretty long. The creation of various variants based on one consistent and tested code base. Um, so um, uh, it's really a huge effort to, to do the tests and the quality assurance um, um, for each and every combination of software and hardware. So it's, it would be really uh, uh, important for us to have something that you can just test and then deploy under a particular configuration then uh, to create a product out of this configuration uh, of the software and the hardware. So um, because then we have to test uh, the software only once and then 
um, derive different products from there. Um, what is also really important to mention here is the increasing and really increasing relevance uh, and of cybersecurity for the connected OT products. So uh, we are really looking for approaches that are to some extent secure by design that um, uh, uh, yeah, we really would try to, to, to use technologies that that really try to reduce the number of, of, of vulnerabilities of our products. Because uh, yeah, in the past, um, uh, in the last decades, most of the OT devices ran in really protected environments, like production networks that were kind of in Fort Knox. <laughs> uh, and, and now this, 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 this well-defined security model um, um, gets more and more holes and, and, and the security of the, of the components inside that, uh, yeah, in the past really uh, well-protected area is getting more and more important. Um, and uh, last but not least, we really have to have a streamlined development process, which also leads to, yeah, to have this core principle of one code base and then a configuration driven deployment. So, and from our point of view, the NetJO has many of these core concepts in mind as a first class citizen, and therefore we decided to contribute to the project uh, by developing and providing architectural innovations and by driving the development of the NetJO core um, written in Rust. Um, and, and all the requirements, mm, yeah, to some extent, must be reflected um, on, 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 the, on the on the product centric business model of IFM. So that means that we that we have to assume that we might hopefully sell edge devices in a three to four digit number per year to customers that implement the applications on their own. And therefore, we must ensure a high level of quality, uh, as I already mentioned. Integrity is also really important. Consistency. And, and also an, an, an excellent user experience, even if it's if it's if it's uh, yeah deployed and configured based on a configuration file. For us, it's always important that that then the user experience of that configuration is 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 excellent and to avoid from a large number of individual services and support cases. And um, and even worse, we want to prevent also from recalling products, which is uh, can be a nightmare. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Um, so this this is something that really drives us, and then therefore we decided uh, because we see lots of these things in in Dinesh and I own, we really want to develop it further into that direction to uh, enable our um, yeah OT products to 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 act and, and to interact in IoT environments. Uh, yeah, that's that's why we why we're here, so to speak. So yeah, but this is. All theory, you know, and, 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 and when, when it comes to 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 concrete questions, sometimes you really need experts, right? And um, um, so, I'm pretty glad that we now have um, uh, all the access to the to this Denatrio community, all the different uh, colleagues there, uh, also from other organizations. Uh, there's lots of knowledge coming in, and today I want to just ask some questions. Um, so and, and and I want to ask Matthias those questions because he's uh, he's here <laughs> and he's my colleague, but but he also stands for all the other colleagues in the team, um, and 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 um, yeah, and, and just yeah, just a couple of questions. So Matthias, thank you for having me here. So uh, for for being here for us to to answer these questions. So. Yeah, I already mentioned it. Cybersecurity, um, something that really bothers and, and and which is really relevant. So, what advantages does the ThinHIO design uh, has uh, for regarding this 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 whole topic? So, how do we cover this? Yeah. So, uh, ThinH itself is built in Rust. It can be used with other languages, of course, but uh, ThinH itself is built in Rust, and Rust has some very interesting properties. So Rust gives you assurance that there is, for example, no sec faults in your mm -hmm. in your code, or you do not access invalid memory okay. and prevents data races. So uh, it's really hard to get things wrong in Rust, and by that you automatically automatically um, have benefits for the security because the attack surface of your program is reduced. Ah, okay, so um, that is, that's really interesting and relevant for us. So. Um, yeah, when it comes to concrete devices, um, um, some of our IFM edge devices in this smart device edge category from the Linux Foundation 
uh, yeah, basically ARM-based single board computers with yeah, industrialized really robust and so on, but in the end, comparable with Raspberry Pis, mm -hmm. um, with full-fledged Linux distributions. So is it possible to deploy Finage I.O. or Finage I.O. configurations on such a device? Yes, definitely. So right now we are targeting a Linux environment mm -hmm. and uh, Debian at the moment, but for example, other Linuxes um, will also be possible. And right now there's some extra effort involved, but that will be reduced in the future, of course. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I already mentioned it. So there's also the, uh, this other category of really constrained devices. So some of our gateways um, will provide platforms with embedded Linux distributions customized to an actual device. Mm -hmm. So uh, so what kind of infrastructure, you know what I mean? So this kind of OS layer services on the uh, are needed to run the mm -hmm. So right now, um, Finage IO relies on uh, MQTT broker mm -hmm. and some service manager, for example, system D that is required um, for running Finage. Ah, okay, yeah, got it. So, um, yeah, and, and, and we also have gateways and, and also these high owning master devices that, that are driven by microcontrollers without any full fledged operation system. So, maybe. Mm -hmm. More yeah, microcontroller related approaches. Um, so, for example, an Ionic Master is such a device. So, and they fall more or less in that category of constrained edge devices. So, really constrained edge mm -hmm. devices. So, is it really, is it already possible? So, in general, to, to deploy and run thin edge on, in such a context? So, um, right now, it's not possible, uh, depending on the actual size of the device. Um, so the answer is no right now, but that might change in the future. And uh, if someone's interested, if you are interested, feel free to reach out. Okay, so maybe it's something that we really have to look on on a case by case thing. Yeah, can imagine. So it's, it's a wide area. Um, yeah, uh, I also mentioned that that with those um, on those devices, there are there are also several other software applications. Um, and we really yeah, try to put there as much as possible and want to scale uh, when, with regards to connected data sources um, mm -hmm. as much as possible. So do we need to reserve many resources for ThinEdge IO? Because, no, so, so yeah. right now we're talking, talking about, uh, we're targeting a low memory footprint, which is something in the megabytes range, like 16 to 32 megabytes and lower is of course better. Wow. Mm -hmm. And we're trying, we're trying re to be really, really light on mm -hmm. CPU usage. And Rust is uh, definitely one thing that helps us a lot there. Okay, yeah, I understand. Um, so, yeah, with this regard, regard so, yeah, we already tried out uh, with Moneo, the, the connectivity solution um, uh, built uh, on top of the Moneo software product. Mm -hmm. But in general, is it easy to have interoperability with existing services and software applications that are already deployed on the same edge device? Mm -hmm. Because usually you cannot assume that Binage I was alone uh, on, mm -hmm. the, on the planet, right? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yes, definitely. So interoperability is definitely key with Binage. And right now, uh, MQTT is the, the prominent way of having inter, uh, interoperability. Um, and it will continue to be but other protocols and ways to, to connect to Monet, uh, to Finage, sorry, um, will definitely be possible in the future. So as the project continues. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for the answers. So uh, yeah, so many questions, but yeah, can you mention so? Yeah, are there other questions in the audience? Um, so as always, just raise your hand. So um, there are lots of experts from the team, not only Matthias, but uh, also other colleagues from Software AG and, and also contribu con con contributors maybe. Um, so are there questions? Um, so just speak up. I actually have one from here from the sidelines a little bit uh, coming in. So one question is, do I need to learn Rust now to extend and work with ThinEdge? Yeah, it's a quite interesting question. So my favorite is already coming here. So, um, so you would definitely not need to learn Rust to use Finetch as an end user. 
And as a developer, you would have the choice of using either Rust if you want to, but definitely are not forced to use it and uh, basically would just interact with FinEdge from the outside, as a, I would call it almost like as a black box with the configuration next to it. Great, great. Yeah, I think that's also one of the principles, right? I explained in the beginning that we really don't, we do realize that a lot of companies, there are a lot of devices out there leveraging other programming languages and existing stacks that we basically want to integrate with. As far as I see in the faces here on my side, um, for, for my colleagues as well, for me, and it was quite interesting event today, uh, really some uh, interesting insights. Um, so, what do you think, Nadine? Uh, look back on the event. <laughs> First of all, thank you everyone so much for especially also to you guys, the presenters, for sharing all this exciting, interesting information and updates with us. I certainly appreciate it very much and I enjoyed this session a lot. I learned a lot. I hope uh, all of you also can take away some uh, new things and um, find inspiration to do more and contribute and help grow this community because at the end of the day that's what it's all about an open source initiative can only thrive with a large global community as well contributing to to it right we launched thin edge with the intent to become more autonomous um, with regards to cloud connectivity. Mm, and we all of us feel very strongly about this as an open source initiative. And we're really hoping to establish this uh, as a true um, global force. <laughs> open source, the global force, yes. Unfortunately, we're nearly running out of time for our session today. That there is one more thing, Nadine. Yes, uh, please, Andre. Yes, so we would also like to prepare for the next meetup. So we have yes. one last poll for all of you, mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, the question of what do you want to see in the next meetup? Great, I see answers coming in as well. Configuration management, use cases, IoT connectors, uh, very real life application specific input as well. Uh, how can we apply? what we're building here in the real world out there. Yeah, it's really great. Configuration mm -hmm. management is, is a good topic. We are working mm -hmm. on that at the moment. So mm -hmm. hopefully in the next meetup, we can already show um, what is possible. Yeah? Awesome. OK, wow, there are more, more mm -hmm. input coming. User examples, that seems to be a big topic. Yeah. Uh, use cases. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah, cool. Perfect. Interfacing connectors, uh, child devices, machine learning. Oh, that's a new one. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> How can we integrate artificial intelligence ML? Um, yeah. And technology related topics as well. Docker container, I see here. Yeah. Yeah. Use interface for to support the, the, the composition and, and, and configuration seems to be relevant as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Making it less user this is this is awesome. A crowdsourced agenda <laughs> already <laughs> for the next session. I love it. Yeah. That way we can really ensure that we're relevant to all of you, the community as well. Yeah. Ongoing. Yeah, speaking of the next event, the date is not yet fixed. Uh, we're aiming for end of June, beginning of July, knowing full well that we're running into full force of summer holidays. Um, but yeah, so stay tuned. I yeah, will definitely um, communicate the time, date uh, in a proper manner yeah, to give you also enough time and space to plan in. Um, this next upcoming event and we're really looking forward to seeing you and also whoever else you want to entice and excite to join the community in the meantime. Um, 
in our next community meetup in Q, end of Q2, beginning of Q3. Um, we're also, as the two uh, contributing partners, Software AG and IFM, here representing the ThinEdge IO project team, we wanted to make you aware that we're also always recruiting in this space, uh, looking for um, adding uh, new competent people into our teams. Um, so absolutely feel free to reach out to us as well if you are interested in joining any of our companies um, in a professional context as well. So with that, any closing remarks, Matthias, Andre, from your sides? We have just one call left. Uh, so um, uh, just to, to give you the opportunity to also give feedback on the session today. Um, um, so we can maybe just find that up. As a closing, exactly. That's and great. We all stay maybe uh, just a short number of, of minutes um, here in the session. And if you have any questions, if you want to speak up, if, if you want to articulate maybe a more complex thing for the next events coming up, uh, use that. Um, and then, yeah, we will hope to see you again soon. And yeah, we hope to that you got inspired then. Uh, All right, everyone. Thank you again to all the presenters, Andre, Matthias, Matthias, Marcel, especially to you guys as well, um, for sharing all the new updates with all of us. Thanks to everyone for taking the time and joining us here today. Mm, this meetup will also be um, put on YouTube, so you can definitely also check that out on demand if you want to go back and revisit some of the sessions as well. And with that, I would like to wish all of you a great rest of your Wednesday evening or afternoon, depending on which time zone you are logging in now. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you next time. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye-bye, everybody.